it's always an interesting symbol and one learns from everything so the first thought that struck me was uh, when the door was being closed that we have to open <laughs> we are told we have to open but open only to the mother <laughs> not to all kinds of noises and voices all around and it's an interesting paradox because very often um, when we shut our doors to everything else <clears throat> it may look like we are narrowing and how come this narrowing can lead to wideness which which the which is the goal of yoga so it's very interesting because um, it's not exactly a narrowing but touching the key or the heart of creation now once we touch the heart of creation or the key to creation then uh, automatically wideness follows because wideness in the original sense is not simply an accumulation of uh, information facts figures forces energies but to climb from one tier to another this is very interesting that the vedas speak of wideness but the, the what they mean by wideness is not simply accommodating different points of views that is of course one aspect but the wideness that they speak of is ascension from physical to vital so that's how the fullness comes the vedic path the other day someone asked me to speak on the vedic path and i was wondering we have to speak again of uh, an effort which was in way back of course it's very interesting to see that effort and how it parallels with um, shobhinda and the mother's yoga but nevertheless is very interesting when we look at the path that the vedic rishis followed that the path of wideness was that from the physical animal existence they would um, rise to a vital existence which was again vital fullness the joy of life the energy of life from that the next step of wideness was rising to the mental world and from the mental world to rise to the world which was beyond beyond even the highest mental possibilities beyond the mental heavens and then still further the fifth world or the fourth world to the supramental world so this was very interesting that the path of wideness was not horizontal but a vertical ascension and as one ascended vertically one also automatically became wider and wider and for that the vedic rishis touched the key to creation in another way we of course uh, it has been made much simpler for us thanks to the mother's grace but the vedic rishis were not fortunate enough to have the grace of the infinite mother so they had to ascend to that level the path they followed was touching another key in creation and that key is agni so agni is called as jat vedas the knower of all births because it is there in all that is there in creation everything that is created agni is present because it is the divine will and the divine wisdom it's very interesting the image of agni is the image of heat and light so it is the power as well as the wisdom that is working in creation it is another way to say the divine consciousness which is at the heart of all creation but agni is visualized in the vedas she is uh, he he or she or it is the divine will and the divine wisdom which is working and constantly the vedic rishis invoke agni to lead through the path of the right and the light towards the vastness towards the truth now this is one of the first very interesting things that they also the first effort in the vedas was to touch that heart to touch that core and that's why one of the reflections that the vedic rishis ponder about is that we have to reach to the deva now deva is not just any god in the vedic sense the deva is the infinite being this is another very interesting thing because uh, there is a tendency when we speak of the divine as simply an impersonal consciousness but the vedic rishis saw the divine not just as an impersonal consciousness but as a conscious infinite being so they had to reach that deva but that deva is infinite and our state is finite that deva is illimitable and our state is a limited being that deva is surpasses all conceptions all that thought can weave all that our human effort can lead us to and we are here in this sphere of mortality so how are we to reach that deva that infinite being that infinite consciousness so they were in search of that principle which can serve as a bridge we have of course we are very fortunate to have the golden bridge 
Shubhendra speaks of the mother as she is the golden bridge. And then in the same breath he says the wonderful fire. So it's very interesting that the Vedic Rishis, they don't, um, because she has not incarnated as the Divine Mother in their midst, for that the Vedic Rishis have to wait for um, maybe 10,000 years. Now they would be happy to see that she has incarnated in our midst. But at that point of time, they were invoking the fire and they described this fire in very interesting way. It has neither the head nor feet. So if one really reads some of these Vedic images, they uh, can be very mind-boggling. So it doesn't have a head because it merges into the infinite. It, it extends into the infinite. It doesn't have a feet because it goes down into the, through the nether worlds, right into the densest darkness. So the Agni becomes the bridge between the state of darkness here and the state of light and knowledge above. The second interesting thing was that Vedic Rishis had a glimpse of the supermind but in a very different way. Now each path has searched for um, some aspect of the other of the infinite, of the divine. He is infinite and some aspect of the other each path has. For instance, Bhakti searches for the infinite bliss, beatitude, ananda and love and rapture that comes through love of the divine, sweetness of the divine. Then the path of knowledge searches for the true self and the knowledge in which the knower and the known become one. The path of works searches for the master of works, the will that is active in the cosmos. Vedic rishis were in search of immortality. Whereas in our yoga we search for perfection. It's very interesting that the two terms. Now immortality, when the Vedic rishis went in search of immortality, they found that everything that is within limitations is mortal. So to start with, we know that physical body is mortal. Then we discover that our feelings are mortal. In the sense, today we have one kind of feelings and tomorrow we will have another kind of feelings. And it's a very interesting meditation and very simple practical thing of life that very often we, are, we flow in a certain current of feeling. And after a while, we see that these feelings are either changing into something, ascending towards something more beautiful, or these feelings are dipping towards something else, but nevertheless they are changing. Now, if we follow the upward current, these feelings change and large and grow into something beautiful and divine. If we follow the downward current, they will gradually gravitate and disappear and vanish, leading to division and disintegration. So it's very interesting that they are changing. Similarly with thought. We hold on to a thought. But thought itself can have these two movements. A thought which starts from one point, goes deeper and upward, deeper and upward like a flame ascending to heaven, till it widens into uh, something not just beautiful, but something which is powerful. So much so that it can change things. That's how Sri Aurobindo puts in Savitri. One lonely thought becomes omnipotent. Now, This is the power of thought. When we go deeper into anything, similarly with will, our will can ascend further, or it can go down. But normally again will is changing. Today I will one thing, tomorrow I will another thing. And at one point I will one thing in the morning. In the afternoon I am willing something else. At night something else. So will itself is not really following a path. But it is caught up in a maze and haze. So Vedic Rishis were searching for a path that would lead to a limitless state of being. Because they realized that as long as anything which is limited is prone to death. So mortality in the, in the original sense of the Veda was not about shedding the body. It is understood. Body's death is one kind of mortality. But anything which is subject to limitation is bound to die. It may live for a short while, it may live for a long while. Certain thoughts and ideas have governed humanity through large spaces of time. But eventually they reach a point which is mortal, where they will meet a deadlock. And perhaps that is what is meant by the second coming and the return of an avatar. When Buddha says that after 2,500 years, there will be a return. Basically it means that whatever energy, the thought, the idea that has released in the world will act up to a given point of time. But beyond a certain point, this idea has to either enlarge or change into something else. Otherwise this idea would have become a spent force. Now, 2005 years is not an ordinary span of time. But the beauty of the Vedas is that the Vedas, because they were in search of a limitless condition of being, despite going through a period of 
you know, cycles when the Vedas were lost. This is a whole history in itself, how the Vedas were lost and recovered. They were lost during the Upanishadic period because Upanishads tried to take up only the symbolic element of the Veda. They turned everything into an inner journey. So in Vedas we find both external and inner. So there is a whole external process, ritual, sacrifice, etc., which is external, which was meant for those who were not ready for the inner path. And there is a whole inner meaning to everything. The cow, the horse, the gritam, the rain, the soma, everything has an inner meaning, inner and outer at once. But Upanishads completely removed the outer meaning and turned it inner. Now, the problem of human mind is the moment you turn it inner, then it loses hold on the outer. And this Upanishad landed up with Vedanta. And the end of Vedanta was that there is one without a second and this world is an illusion. So, it's very interesting that following the trail of the Vedas, one came to a totally opposite philosophy and totally opposite conception of life, that all this is maya, all this is ritual. Simply because one small fatal step was taken and that step was to remove the outer aspects of the Vedas and keep only the symbolic inner meaning. This small step, Sri speaks about it. And of course, finally, Buddhism came and finished off whatever little was left. Then again, Vedas return. They return. And then again, they are lost. Then again, they return. And finally, we see that Sri in this cycle rescues the Veda again and puts a new meaning, the, the original sense of the Vedas. So we see in the Vedas, there is a search for immortality. And in that search, they found that unless we discover the limitless being, we cannot arrive at a state of immortality. Even the mental worlds, one can stay there. Heavens also have a term. That is the famous stories that when one goes to heaven and the uh, Nachiketa himself is offered, this is a Upanishadic story, that Nachiketa is offered the boon of the heavens. And Nachiketa says, okay, I will have all these things, death, but tell me, uh, how long will you give them to me? Hundred years, thousand years, so death is keeping silent, ten thousand years. Will it end one day? So death says yes, one day it is going to end. It cannot be limitless, it cannot be termless. So Nachiketa immediately asks him, give me that knowledge through which I can arrive at immortality. So again, immortality is about the limitless condition of being. Limited being is mortal. Limited mind, limit, limited power of life, limited physical existence, limited sense of self is subjection to death. Whereas the one is infinite, infinite condition of being, infinite existence, infinite consciousness, infinite delight will never end. Now the Vedas found this path, but when they reached the upper limits of the mind, this is another interesting parallel. They found that they could leap into that and vanish. Now, it's very interesting that Vedic Rishis were very realists. They were not illusionists. So they said, this is uh, not fair because this not infinite condition of the being that we want. This not just the kind of immortality they want. So they went the other way, the reverse path. And in the reverse path, they started digging deep and deep and deep, 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 deep into matter. Now, when they went into matter, they found another kind of obstacles than when they were ascending. And this also we find in Sri Yoga. When we ascend, take the ascending path, when we ascend from mind to vital, vital to mental, mental to higher mental worlds, higher mental world to the worlds of intuition and revelation, we find that we are offered resistance by the powers of light. So they help us, but they will not let us go beyond. So reason will help us to get to, to master and control our animal vitality. But reason becomes a barrier if it has to release us into the higher mind. Now the higher mind with its symbolic knowledge and the gods of the higher mind help us to understand this creation better. But they will not let go to release us into the intuitive mind. So these are powers of light which will not allow us. They will bind us somehow or the other. And uh, they can bind us in fantastic ways. For instance, um, when we ascend to the higher mind or something still higher, there are so many revelations, so many things crowd upon the mind that sometimes one wants to put it into a form of a writing or speak about it. 
बट इट टाइम कम्स वेन वन डिस्कवर दीज वेरी रेवल्यूशन आर प्रिवेंटिंग वन फ्रॉम आइडेंटिफिकेशन इट्स वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग स्वामी विवेकानंद स्पीक्स अबाउट इट ही सेज इट ऑल दिस हैज टू बी स्टॉप्ड आई कॉन्ट हेल्प इट माई माइंड इज एक्सप्लोडिंग विद दिस इट्स इट्स ए लाइट दैट द माइंड वॉन्ट्स टू एक्सप्रेस एंड एक्सप्रेस एंड एक्सप्रेस एंड येट दिस वेरी रिवेलेशन इफ वन अलाउज जस्ट दैट प्ले then it can continue 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 and one cannot ascend to the next level so there comes a time when one has to quiet in the revelations and one enters into a state of identification so this is one kind of obstacles and the vedas speak of it they speak of the gods as helping in the journey then they speak of the gods as hindering in the journey so the mother has done a radical surgery she has removed that obstacle completely she says the age of religions is over and the world of the gods is no more required she speaks about it because the vedas use that path the vedic rishis did not have the great privilege the the tremendous grace that we have today that we can directly turn to the source the mother of all gods they could not straight away they invoke aditi but it's much later first they invoke indra then they invoke um, uh, first they invoke agni then they invoke indra so indra acts from the higher minds and then he clears the ground then after indra has done the job then they will invoke varuna then they will invoke mitra then they will invoke bhag som and so on and so forth long journey and each of these gods will help them to a point but they will not release beyond that point because even gods quarrel but in different ways they quarrel not like us human beings of course sometimes human beings quarrel like gods but each god fashions an idea so there would be two contrary ideas and to take a practical example how the gods can quarrel in a human mind because they act upon the human mind through suggestions we we have we may have often wondered in life if there is a choice between justice and mercy which one should we choose this is a interesting dilemma on one side justice is a godhead because after all justice preserves the balance of the worlds what is wrong what is dark needs to be in a sense meted out its fate on the other side there is the god of kindness and mercy it says doesn't matter it is kindness and mercy which should rule and the mother interestingly describes this she says when i was um, young many of the mantras came to me she says that she has traveled the vedic path in her own way beautiful way so because she has to cover that whole ground so she says that one particular mantra came to me in french and for 25 years it continued not in ordinary time and that mantra was in french i won't be able to pronounce it correctly but in english the translation was o lord of kindness and mercy o lord of kindness and mercy lord of kindness and mercy this continued continued and then she says now i know why it came because this helps in the ascension much more because if we invoke justice that is why she says much later my child don't call justice if justice comes none of you will be able to stand because if i invoke justice then i must be ready to face the trial <laughs> if i ask for justice i should be the first one to present myself so if we invoke kali kali first thing she will do is slay our ego not somebody else's ego and it happens we have life of swami vivekananda when he towards the end sister nivedita describes very beautifully there is a book the master as i saw him she says that towards the end of his physical existence particularly last 2 3 years he would get into the mood of inviting kali and he would sing songs that i love you mother the terrible come i love you as death i love you as misery come death come misery come mother the terrible he was invoking her and no wonder i mean she of course he was invoking because his goal was to merge into that and he wanted to be freed from this trap in which he was caught up and sure enough the mother came but when she came he lost his balance sister nivedita says since the time he started invoking kali we saw that his health became fragile and his nerves could no more bear after that and within 2 years swami a man as leonine and mighty as swami vivekananda could not bear the pressure and he left the body of course it was his goal so it is perfectly fine and he had felt he had done what he had to do 
but when we invoke a particular godhead that godhead must first work within us so we have to be very careful which aspect of the divine we are invoking so the mother would invoke the lord of kindness and mercy because when we invoke kindness and mercy then whatever our failings they would be kindness and mercy and constantly the kindness and mercy will be with us and carry us through it if we invoke love then constantly that sweetness beatitude will be with us so this was the path that the vedic rishis followed but it's a long and tortuous path each god kindness god of kindness will not um, shake hands with the god of justice so a whole aspect of creation will be left whereas in the supramental creation all these gods have to be harmonized we cannot have only kindness we cannot have only justice they have to be harmonized we cannot have only god of love we cannot have only god of knowledge they have to be harmonized so this is the difficulty of that path so the mother makes it very easy for us when we turn to her all these gods spontaneously start working and laboring within us this was one particular difference then when they went down there was another kind of obstacle when we ascend there is an obstacle from the gods so they will give us all kinds of lures at that level they will not let us go so a person at the intellectual level will suddenly find all kinds of intellectual conceptions tortuous difficult analytical and he will enjoy it and even write nice papers not realizing that it's a play of the bright gods of the mind who are not allowing him to go further and when he has thought that okay this will be the end the last paper that i am writing suddenly another paper will enter into the head and again he will write after a while another thesis another phd another phd this is the play it will not allow it to go further whereas in the descending path the obstacle come from the forces of darkness and division in the mind one kind of division in the vital another kind of division division of heart division of will division of consciousness in the physical body another kind of division and yet at each level the division has to be cleared so much so that the mother at one place says when i was trying to clear the obstructions in the body this division which was so prominent my child had to struggle for so many years she is saying the word so many years until i found and realized that every body is one single body then she could say that it does not matter whether it is realized in this body or some other body because it is one body i am reminded of another statement of nalnida which uh, someone narrated to me personally when he went to meet nalnida along with his wife on his birthday so nalnida looked at him for a while and then he said you know your body her body this body they are all one body i suppose this what is meant by the entry into the collective consciousness and working there but they went still further and when they started going deeper again they found the path blocked so when they started going up they found the path blocked the highest mental world the over mind gods will not release them into the supramental gnosis and down below there is the big block sitting the subconscious will not allow it to go further down where again the super mind is concealed and involved and the vedic rishis call that concealed sun in the matter as martand the eighth sun of aditi seven suns sign in the higher firmament and once he has released into the earth so he is the sun who is the outcast and he is caught up in the forces of darkness maybe the story of karna is in some way symbolic of this and this eighth sun has to struggle out battling with the forces of darkness and it's only he who can finally come and be the victor and then only the vedic rishis can fulfill the dream of immortality so it was a wonderful dream a beautiful document this is not the first document the mother and shubhendra both affirm that the vedas were derived from an earlier tradition and the vedic path was also tried by the kabala the jewish tradition and also by the chaldean tradition so it is not that the only vedas were trying this path the kabala tradition which is around the same time the zoroastrians which are even before the vedas they also tried this 
imperfectly but there is a tradition which goes even beyond it which has no name and the documents are lost and the vedas themselves mention about it in a very interesting way the vedas say we want to follow the path of the forefathers but they never mention who are these forefathers so these are the forefathers who had attempted the path but they could not so we have agast rishi telling lopa mudra how long we have to dig we have dug so much into the subconscious how much more how much more when this passage was read to the mother about agast rishi and lopa mudra digging into the subconscious she simply says hmm she is silent and afterwards she says something else because she has dug and found that son so we'll read a little bit of that aspect of the vedic journey the last aspect we we will read from the mother one we know that the rishis found the supramental sun they glimpsed it standing on the borders of the overmind but they could not fully release their consciousness into that they aspired for that light to come through to into them through the gods so there was some deflection some distortion through each godhead they would invoke that light that knowledge into their mind into their heart this was their effort the gods would help them to receive that light but this is a second hand because the gods cannot directly they are not perfect channels whereas in 1956 the mother completely blew off that passage open the passage from above for that complete light to invade into her being but she says something very interesting what happened in 1956 is not everything it is just a beginning there are many other things to follow which she speaks elsewhere then the other aspect of the vedic journey going down below and clearing the obstacle of the subconscious and the last rock of the inconscient this to see accomplished this was in 1959 when she gives that beautiful uh, new year message that as she went down 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 she struck upon an almighty spring now there is a very interesting backdrop to this message she she saw some student and teachers and people of course within us all of us and when she saw them she said they are not interested in anything beyond their little personal life so mother was curious that why don't they want anything beyond their personal life why are they not interested in anything other than their little life so see the way divine works if it was a human being he would scold and give a big lecture on sadhana and say you people are wasting your time she didn't say anything she went into their atmosphere and she says when i went into their atmosphere she started feeling stifling suffocating imagine that infinite consciousness entering into a narrow mind into a small little mind into pettiness into selfishness she says as i went down i felt more and more suffocated more and more suffocated but then she would not give up she said i wanted to see what is at the bottom what is at the root and she says shivinda has described it in the god's labor probably shivinda was doing this in his own way with all of us humanity she goes down and down and down and then she says at the very bottom of the inconscient i found an almighty spring and that suddenly throws her up and when she comes up she sees it was vibrating with the seeds of the new world and then she discovers that all this is simply a shadow which will be replaced by that force which is gushing from within and that spring she released it is a very interesting double action what shubindra speaks of in the mother a call from below a fixed and unfailing call from below and a supreme grace from above that answers so she becomes the bridge and she bridges the gap from both sides on one side she opens the door of the beyond so the whole effort of the vedic journey comes to a grand culmination in one direction but this is not enough to facilitate the journey further she opens also the doors from below and thereby she becomes the golden bridge and the wonderful fire so we read just a little bit of that in fact as a bridge there are quite a few places where mother becomes the bridge and um, 
this was her great and difficult role. One of the bridges she builds, builds is when she was with Theo in Algeria, where she builds a bridge through the dark, vital world, so that people who die, they don't have to get caught up in the difficult um, journey through the vital. So she built a wonderful bridge, so that those who have little faith and aspiration will go through that. So this was one of the bridges she built. Then she builds a bridge between the rapture and the calm. This is how Sri Aurobindo describes her. The bridge between the peace of the infinite and the attraction of man towards that and the rapture which is the dance of the infinite in creation. So build, she builds a bridge. So henceforth creation can dance with Krishna without losing the peace and the calm that are at the backdrop. And finally she bridges the bridge between the wonder and the abyss. So she speaks of um, this very interestingly. This digging down and finally touching that. Truly speaking, perhaps one is never rid of the hostile forces as long as one has not permanently immersed into the light. There the term hostile forces loses its meaning. They become only forces of progress. They force you to progress. But to see things in this way, you have to get out of the lower hemisphere. For below they are very real in their opposition to the divine plan. So it's very interesting. If you look at things from the larger and divine point of view, there are no hostile forces. They are simply forces of progress. It's very interesting because they both conspire towards one great end. It was said in the ancient traditions that one could not live for more than 20 days in this higher state without leaving one's body and returning to the supreme origin. This has been said by Sri Ramakrishna. This has been said by Sri Raman Maharishi. It is documented very well. But Mother says something very interesting. Now this is no longer true. This is called divine humility. She is not saying that I am able to do it. She is simply saying now this is no longer true. It is precisely this state of perfect harmony beyond all attacks that will become possible with the supramental realization. It is what all those who are destined for the supramental transformation will realize. The hostile forces know it well. In the supramental world, they will automatically disappear. Having no further utility, they will be dissolved without our having to do anything simply through the presence of the supramental force. So she is also giving us a key. Our mind should not be occupied with hostile force. Everybody who falls ill is an attack of hostile force. Everything that happens contrary to my wish is an attack of hostile force. Our concentration has to be on the supramental force and not on the hostile force. So by its very presence, invocation and pressure, it will be dissolved. So, now they are being unleashed with a fury in a negation of everything, everything. The link between the two worlds has not yet been built, but it is in the process of being built. This was the meaning of the experience of February 3rd, 58, to build a link between the two worlds. So, this is the experience of the supramental boat, where she builds a bridge between this world and the other. For both worlds are indeed there, not one above the other, but within each other. So this is one world she's built. Now the disciple asks this question, what is the relationship between this experience and that of November 7th? This is the experience of the Almighty Spring, which she gives in the New Year message. In, in what is what you found in the depths of the inconscient, this same supramental? So Mother says, the experience of November 7 was a further step in the building of the link between the two worlds. So we, we celebrate of course 1956, 29th February and uh, it's very beautiful but there are so many celebrations which have followed it. The Superman consciousness, the almighty spring, we, we don't even talk about it because this was as important, perhaps a more important step in the evolutionary journey. She says it was a further step where I was cast was clearly into the origin of the supramental creation. In fact, she says it was the shorter route because it is within matter. 
it is the shorter route she says not the one which goes through the ascension all this warm gold this tremendous living power she is describing now this this sovereign peace and once again i saw that the values governing the supramental world have nothing to do with our values here the same thing she discovers in the february third experience she says i discovered that the values here have nothing to do with the values there and then she was asked what do you mean by that she says all that man has regarded as important as interesting as spiritual it has nothing to do with what the supramental world sees and then she was asked mother please tell us what what are those values and she describes of course a couple of them we'll talk about it later some day in fact we had probably a class on that so she says again i saw when i went down that the values which that is looking for are different even the values of our highest wisdom even those we consider the most divine when we live constantly in a divine presence it is utterly different she says even things so challenging is this idea that even things which we regard as constantly living in the divine presence they are different from what those values are in the supramental creation whose seeds are there within not only then she is making it still elaborate not only in our state of adoration and surrender to the supreme but even in our state of identification the quality of the identification is different depending upon whether we are on this side progressing in this hemisphere or the other hemisphere the higher hemisphere and this we find very interestingly in the synthesis of yoga every mystic has identified with some aspect of the divine and he has described it or tried to describe it but we feel something is different about sri aurobindo he also speaks of identification with the supreme the mother also is identified with the divine what is the difference we cannot fathom because to be identified with the divine while still the consciousness is on the mental and one takes a leap is different than identifying with the divine taking a supramental station so she says that itself is different the quality or the kind of relation i had with the supreme at that moment was entirely different from the one we have here even the identification has a different quality here we have reached the end the summit but it's a quality that is different the quality in the sense that a fullness a richness a power is there but there is a something that eludes us it's truly a new reversal of consciousness and then she tries to uh, put it in words and she says that these words are poor in comparison with the splendor and then she says finally something very interesting it was only the surface of things she is describing a what is the surface of things the splendor the whole spiritual life the whole spiritual life of the psychic being and of all our present consciousness that appeared so warm so full so wonderful so luminous to the ordinary consciousness well all this splendor seems poor in comparison to the splendor of the new world so it's very good to remember so that we don't stop at anything at a beautiful psychic realization or nice experiences of the spiritual kind she says all this appears poor it was only the surface of things the surface of the experience behind the surface there is a depth and only when one enters into this depth does one touch the true thing and it is the same experience each time is surface with all that it entails of inaccuracy and artificial transcription it feels like something not really alive you step into another zone and you feel you have uncovered the source and the power and the truth of things so what are we to do this is she is saying even the psychic and spiritual life are nothing compared to that so she says there is night and sun night and sun and night again many nights but one must cling to this will for surrender 
cling as through a storm and put everything into the hands of the supreme lord until the day when the sun shall shine forever the day of total victory i think there is one more small little thing if i can find it yes so she says one way is the surrender to the supreme lord in everything in every way and it will take you to the ultimate sun and the victory the second process he gives so vedic in its method widen yourself as far as the extreme bounds of the universe and beyond take upon yourself always all the necessities of progress and dissolve them in the ecstasy of unity then you will be divine so this is the wide path starting from the path of the vedas and ending with the creation of the supramental world